So hi, everyone. I'm Trish Ruswick. I am the team lead on the social team. And like Eli said, I'm going to be talking about unpacking social trends 2024 for nonprofits. So we only have five minutes. So let's just dig right in. Hootsuite's annual trends report is based on a commercial survey of 4,200 marketers and a consumer survey of 4,500 cons consumers. We interviewed people from 118 countries, 16 industries, directors, social marketers, partners, including some of our partners who helped us write this report, Giving Tuesday and Pulsar. During our research, three major trends started to present themselves, the ROI trend, the platform trend, and the AI trend. Considering today we have several incredible speakers talking about AI, I wanted to focus primarily on the ROI trend and the platform trend. Let's jump into ROI. Your audience has spoken and they want to be entertained. After staying in touch with family and friends, the top reason people are using social media is to be entertained. The problem we're seeing is that 44% of nonprofit organizations publish product and brand updates or news multiple times a week, and sometimes more than once a day. The major problem with this is when we asked audiences what would harm how they viewed brands on social, 34% said brands or organizations that are too focused on self-promotion. So we're seeing a huge disconnect between what organizations are posting and what audiences want to see and quite frankly want to engage with. Plus, 80% of nonprofits say their top metric for demonstrating ROI is through engagements. Needless to say, posting content that your audience doesn't necessarily want to engage with is taking a huge hit on your ROI. It is likely contributing to the concern nonprofits are having about reporting and proving their ROI. So what does this mean? You might jump to associating entertainment with humor and lightheartedness, but really what people wanted to see is something enjoyable. This could be something funny. It might also be something education, educational or hopeful. All to say, don't overthink it. 53% of consumers say that organizations should be more relatable on social. So we're encouraging you to be more social on social. Comment on other people's content. Ask your audience questions through the poll functionality on IG, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Jump on social trends and adapt it to your niche. It's a slow burn, but content that serves your audience will result in stronger relationships. Basically, we want you to use social for your organization like you use social for yourself. Now, moving along, right along into our platform trend. You work in nonprofit, the nonprofit space. Your time is precious and your resources are often very limited. But you've been told for years that you need to be where your audience is. I'm here today to tell you that philosophy is dead. We've shifted our mindset and hope to shift yours too. We don't want you to be everywhere. We want you to be present on the channels that drive the greatest results you can make engaging content for, that you have time to manage, and quite frankly, the ones that you like to be on. Creating engaging content is one of the biggest factors in this trend because cross-posting just does not cut it anymore. Each network has its own set of rules, trends, lingos, image specs, algorithms, etc. Content that fits each network performs better and creates a better experience for your target audience. And as a nonprofit social marketer, you're responsible for developing strategies, creating content, tracking analytics, responding to comments, scheduling posts, and staying up to date with the constant platform trends. You already got a lot going on, basically what I'm trying to say. So now that I've told you to cut out some networks, which ones are you picking? We found that nonprofit organizations were most confident in Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, driving a positive return on investment for their organization. We also found that the top three social channels for nonprofits to be present on were Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Perfect. But I also did want to point out that compared to other industries we looked at for this report, nonprofits do use social YouTube at a very high rate in comparison to other networks. What are your next steps? First, we want you to run a social audit for the platforms you're currently on. If you're feeling the pressure to be everywhere, audit your presence on those different networks. Then go at the platforms that are driving results and are aligned with your organization's goals and basically cut out the rest. And finally, master the art of cross-posting. And yes, I know I just told you that cross-posting isn't cutting it anymore, but there is an exception to the rule. When you have content that can resonate across all of your channels, absolutely you should use it. As long as you're not using the copy and paste method and are making changes to the content on each network, we aren't opposed to you trying this type of cross-posting. I know this was super quick, so I hope you do check out the full report on our website. I'll store it in the chat here as well. It's full of great and useful tools and digs into more of our AI. And for nonprofits, you can always check out Hootsuite, where you can save up to 75%. I'm Joel Harrison. I'm a marketing and messaging consultant for nonprofits and social enterprises. 
And obviously, you've heard it a thousand times and you're probably using it. It has been changing people's workflows and, and lives for the last little while now. And for good reason too, right? We look at some of the benefits. We're looking at saving time, doing more with less. Obviously, as nonprofits, we're, we're always trying to squeeze as much as, as we can out of the time that we have. And we also want to improve quality of communications and generate more ideas and more content. And there's so many ways that you can use AI in your communication specifically, whether it's email drafts, article drafts, website copy, creating presentations, outlines. One of the best ways that I've liked to use AI is to eliminate the blank page anxiety. So whenever you come to that new piece of content or that new email that you're trying to create, there's always that hesitation of like, where do I start? And when you use AI, ChatGPT, or any of these other kind of models, um, it can eliminate that. And so there's so many benefits uh, to using AI, and I'm glad that lots of people are diving into it. But there's also concerns to watch for, right? Especially when we think about um, nonprofit and civil, civil society context. Um, issues can come up with copyright and plagiarism, accuracy of information, missing context and cultural nuance. You can also end up with repetitive content when different people are using the similar types of responses from some of these AI programs. And what we want to do is be cautious, careful, and be able to move forward in a way that gives us confidence in the way that we're moving forward. And we're not going to accidentally slide into some of these concern areas, right? And so what I wanted to talk about today was three rules for using AI for your nonprofit comms that can help frame just how you think about it, how you approach it in a little bit of a different way so that we can help avoid some of these potential concerns in the future as AI continues to take over some of our workflows. So rule number one, let AI help you with everything, but don't make it do everything for you. So when we think about how it's elevating our processes and our methods, everything from research drafting outlines to editing and publishing it can do a lot in a lot of these different areas but what i would encourage is that we don't offload the work to ai we let ai help us do the work so that we still have oversight over these different parts of the process and that we're not essentially taking a copy pasted answer from one of these ai programs and putting that into our communications and so if we think about it as AI is helping us through this process as opposed to AI is doing this for me, it can be a kind of a smoother introduction to using some of these tools in your communications. Rule number two, treat AI as a junior staff member. And what I mean by this is that we so often look at AI as the expert, the, the all-knowing, omniscient uh, being that is going to bestow its wisdom on us and ele elevate everything that we do. Uh, and the biggest risk of this is that we start getting lazy and we start giving ownership, we start passing off ownership to an entity that doesn't necessarily deserve it. And so if we treat AI as more of a junior staff member, it means that we're going to actually retain ownership of what we're creating. We're going to have that human oversight and be able to validate and add context because when you have a junior staff member, they usually don't have all of the context. They don't have the specific nuance. They don't have the sensitivities that we might need in nonprofit comms. And we need to treat AI in the same kind of way. Which brings us to rule number three, don't let AI decide, you decide. So it's an extension on what I was just talking about in that there's so much that AI can do, but when it comes to a lot of our foundational communications, brand messaging, website messaging, we need to make sure that we're not, one, accidentally letting AI decide by just taking the first thing that it gives to us in our communications, or we're not intentionally letting it decide and saying, hey, what is the best way to do this? And then just going with whatever answer is provided. So I would suggest that when we're moving forward to using more AI in our communications, that we're still retaining our human control. We're still being the center, center point of that communication as humans, as people with context in whatever we create, but use AI to help you do that. If you'd like to uh, chat more about it or, or talk with me, uh, you can reach me, my email or website here. I'll put my LinkedIn in the chat as well. Thank you. My name is Charlene Gandhi, and I am the tech and data reporter over at Future of Good. And if you haven't come across us before, we are a digital publication covering the Canadian nonprofit uh, philanthropic and social purpose sector. 
I've been in this role for about 15 months now, and I'd say one of the things that has come up really unexpectedly time and time again is this issue of cybersecurity in the nonprofit sector. We first reported on this back in March 2023 when the Canadian Centre for Nonprofit Digital Resilience convened a uh, working group to uncover some of the reasons that the sector seems to be particularly susceptible to uh, cybersecurity risks and breaches. Um, through that reporting, we actually heard a number of stories from charities um, all over Canada. Scouts Canada spoke to us about a data breach on its online registration form, and the uh, YWCA was subject to a ransomware attack. And even though they had backed up all of their data onto an external hard drive, the issue that they came up against was that they also found that their IT supplier wasn't a huge help at that point in time. More recently, we've seen a number of major organizations continue to be subject to cyber attacks. So in late 2022, SickKids was subject to a ransomware attack that halted all its internal systems. In October last year, the Toronto Public Library was subject to a cyber attack. And in the very, very early days of 2024, the Toronto Zoo has also been subject to a data breach. So in each case, we're really seeing that it's becoming more and more clear that nonprofit can't sit on their laurels when it comes to protecting their digital and their technical assets. So there are a number of different types of cybersecurity risks and attacks to keep an eye on. The most standard or well-known is the data breach in which sensitive or personal or financial information of donors, funders, or even community members is discovered by bad actors and used for personal gain. And as I've spoken about, there is also the ransomware attack, which is when data is essentially held hostage um, until an organization pays a monetary ransom to get it back. Now, in the case of this one, it's really important to remember that it's not the data itself that is valuable to the bad actors. It's that the data is important to you as an organization and that they can use that to their advantage to get a ransom out of you. In the sector, there are a number of reasons why nonprofits are more susceptible to these risks. Frontline staff might not see cybersecurity as everyone's responsibility. And with the rise of working from home and remote work patterns, staff might also be using devices that aren't equipped with the necessary security patches. On a similar note, some nonprofits and community organizations are using donated technology, which of course is given to them with the best intentions, but might not now be receiving the most up to date security patches. And finally, a lot of nonprofits are also reporting that they are struggling to find the funding for cybersecurity infrastructure, software, and training. And because it's unlikely to be related to a particular program cost, there are fewer pots of funding available for this kind of critical work. Of course, organizations everywhere are subject to cybersecurity breaches, but in the nonprofit sector, that lasting damage can be absolutely massive. You're talking about the personal or sensitive data of people who are already vulnerable. And if that gets into the hands of bad actors, they can also be subject to things like identity theft or financial fraud, which puts them in even more vulnerable situations. And of course, a data breach in the nonprofit sector can also result in a loss of trust and reputational damage, which, which can also have a knock-on impact on donations going forward. Through our reporting, we have come across three potential solutions to help nonprofits become more resilient to cybersecurity risks and attacks. The first is for nonprofits to run internal audits and create policies and really make cybersecurity every staff member's problem. That's because obviously many nonprofits and community organizations don't have the luxury of having a dedicated team to focus on IT and security. So everybody just needs to take the initiative to upskill, but also remain particularly vigilant to threats that come through, like phishing emails. The Islamic Family and Social Services Association is doing some absolutely fantastic work with their frontline staff, and this is where this image is from, to essentially create a cybersecurity policy that is entirely free of any technical jargon and so that everybody in an organization knows what their responsibility is. Just before the Christmas break, my colleague Gabe Oatley and I also looked into the rise of nonprofits being sold cybersecurity insurance as a separate policy to a general liability or business insurance policy that they would traditionally get. There were a number of perspectives shared in the piece from those who thought it was worth it to those who thought that the uh, investment didn't really make too much sense for them. But crucially, what we did find was that cybersecurity insurance providers are unlikely to offer coverage if the nonprofit hasn't already started to take some sort of preliminary steps to protect their data and their systems. To close, I will say that this is obviously a very overlooked and underfunded challenge in the sector. Treating it as a priority it basically only means that nonprofits are, are doing right by people who use their services and doing right by their donors. But it really also means that they're going to be able to better negotiate with technology providers and even cybersecurity software companies and draw more mutually beneficial deals as well. So thank you all. I'll stop there. I am Mina Bass. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am 
very glad to be here with some amazing part uh, participants and the presenters. I have five minute goal. My five minute goal is to give you five things that can move us to human centric AI. That means I am not going to talk to you about tools, technology, AI itself, or processes. I only want to talk to you about an approach you can take for artificial intelligence. Why am I talking to you? Where is my work coming in here? So I am the CEO of an organization called Namaste Data, which is about data and AI equity. This is, these bubbles are my universe. The one in the blue is my why. I talk about data with inclusion and access. And the pink ones are how I do it. On the left-hand side, for access purposes, I have images. There's my consulting practice, Namaste Data. I do workshops on these topics called Data is for Everyone, which is my school. And when I'm not doing any of those, I'm probably being nerdy on any of the platforms like right now with you all writing and talking about it. We all know AI is already used in our daily lives. Joel talked about it. We are using it. If you have, I don't know if you know about this small company called Netflix, which allows you to eat your food, which can be done in 20 minutes to you can elongate it for two hours. You basically binge watch stuff. That's using AI, right? What's the problem? Human-centered AI or human-centric AI is really what I like to call is designing and using AI in a way that's intentional, purpose-driven, centering communities throughout the AI life cycle. We cannot talk about using AI responsibly at the end or when the technology or the product is already in the market. We have to talk it right from the start to the end. And this is one of my goals in my work and today. So let, let's see a hypothetical example of what's the problem. Say there is a nonprofit called Greenbox, right? But that's an environmental conservation um, organization, and they implemented an AI solution to optimize their fundraising efforts. Their goal is to analyze their donors and predict who is most likely to donate. What are the possible problems that can arise, like algorithmic behaviors? AI can start prioritizing the wealthy donors. That's one. Fundraisers can start focusing on just selecting one or two or three very specific data points, missing out on other data points. Or donors can start questioning the nonprofit about Greenbox's use of AI. What I'm trying to get here is issue when it's not human centric is we are talking about trust and transparency and accountability. How do we ensure that? What can we do? So I'm going to give you five things here. When you are thinking about AI in your organization, I want you to first start listening to your community. Why are you bringing that AI solution? What's the purpose right there? So Greenbox is bringing because they want to improve their fundraising efforts, okay? Centering your why in the repurpose. So now that you've got AI, so Greenbox got it, now what? What are they going to solve in terms of the time saved for the researchers or for the fundraisers? How is that time going to be repurposed? that's going to put some intentionality right in there, right? I want you to think about creating inclusive spaces. When we are thinking of centering our communities in our AI solutions, we have to think about building inclusive and spaces where we feel belong because we need diversity that sets. We need diverse voices when it comes to, and I'm not talking about just the racial diversity, I'm talking about overall diversity that impacts not just how you're collecting data, but throughout the life cycle, all the way up to what are you going to do with that analysis or predictions or outcomes um, in your strategies, right? Then I want you to think about your governance and evaluation. How is this AI helping you? How are you doing what you are doing? How is it supporting you in your work? Really measuring that why. And then most importantly, and probably my favorite, understanding the data. This is non-negotiable for you to really invest your time in what you do with your data and how, where is it coming from? Whose voice is it centering, right? If we do these five things, probably consistently, we are trying our best to center humans in when we are talking about AI. When it comes to, and if I have to give you one question from this five minute session, super quick session, is I want you to ask yourself, what kind of future do you want to live in? How can you build individual accountability and collective power when it comes to you. That's me. I'm kidding. My name is Jesse McKee, and I work as the head of strategy for a nonprofit called 221A. 
And so we're based in uh, Vancouver, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh territories. Um, and what 2218 does is we're a cultural nonprofit. My training is actually, and my background is more as a curator of contemporary art, design architecture, a writer, a researcher, a political scientist. Those are all the hats I've worn in my life. But over the past couple of years, I've been reskilling and diving into um, the digital space. So it can be done, even if it's not your, your original training. So don't be afraid of these computers. And we've been very lucky because we've been supported by federal government, by agencies like the Canada Council for the Arts to do really experimental research and learning in this space to figure out what does the culture sector need? What does the education sector need? What does the nonprofit sector need at large? So I'm happy to speak to all of you today. And one of the things we've been looking at since at least 2019 through the support of partners like that is, is things like blockchain technology, which we all maybe know a little bit about, especially over the past couple of years, like cryptocurrency and NFTs and that sort of thing. But the concept or the orientation or the notion that I want to get underneath all of that stuff is called decentralization. And the trend that we're going to see more and more emerge as we go deeper into this space that is called Web3. So we could say the second era of the web was that read and write era where we could create our own content on platforms like YouTube, on Facebook, all those things we've been talking about so far, like digital marketing. However, in Web3, what we're looking at is a lot of these platforms and a lot of this infrastructure underneath these platforms. So those cloud services, that hardwiring actually is going to start to move outside of these data centers that corporations like Google or Amazon might run in warehouses somewhere like Kansas, where it's nice and cold, where, like, where the cooling isn't as expensive. But actually what's happening is all of this infrastructure is going to start to be dispersed into smaller and smaller spaces. And we're going to start to become operators of our own infrastructure. And we think that is a bonus, maybe not for all things, but for some things. So the question isn't necessarily, is centralization good or decentralization good? I think the question is, what can decentralized technology be used for and what can centralized technology be used for? So similarly, like in previous eras of nonprofit work or civil society work, we would ask the questions, is this capitalist? Is this socialist? Of course, the answer is never that clear. It's never that easy. And it's going to be the same as we go forward into the future. So what 221A, what we're doing is we're trying to do some experiments and looking at where does civil society connect with this decentralized infrastructure or this decentralized internet that's being built um, through Web3. And so what this means is all the compute power for your cloud services, for your AI, for managing your blockchains, all of these sorts of things will become easier to operate on the SME level, so a small medium enterprise level. We started with one project, which is called the Mesh Network, and that's developing a free access Wi-Fi network. It's going to originate in East Van, and that was piloted by a fellow of 221A, Christina Battle, who's an artist. And so what we've started to do is we started to plant these free Wi-Fi nodes in public gardens. So starting with our garden at Union and Gore Street in Vancouver, and then there's another garden run by a group called Living Systems Network up in, up in Mount Pleasant. And so these are places where anybody can connect to these networks and start to expand the Wi-Fi out. So it's a community-run, community-controlled Wi-Fi space that allows free access. So that's one example. Another example of what we're trying to do, which is a much heavier lifting task, is we're starting something called the Node Library. So we're looking at the ways that we can start to operate some of this decentralized hardware and this decentralized infrastructure for the public sector. So blockchains, AI compute, public storage, and new networks for things called like interplanetary file system or RWEED, where your data isn't kept in one location, but it's actually kept in many locations at once. So it's, it's healthy, it's replicatable, and it's persistent. And I always start to tell people that data is less of, think about data as less about something that's going to be hardwired into a stone and something that more has like a living will, like a fungus or like a mushroom or something like this, and it's going to propagate and it's going to persist. So if the liveness is going to continue to be with us. If you want to have a look around at those projects that I spoke about, please get in touch if you have any questions about your decentralized futures. My name is Amy from the UK originally, but I've been working in the nonprofit sector here in Vancouver for almost a year, which is crazy. But what I'd love to do today is just, yeah, as Eli said, condense down, just these like little things you can do within the content marketing sphere to look inward and see how your content is performing, how people are interacting with it and use that to build your strategy. And I think these things can 
look pretty scary if you don't have a lot of time and you think it's not worth it. And it is. I'd love to chat through a bit of that. So start off, I just want to give you a few kind of basic best practices for content marketing. I'm mostly talking about blog content here, but a lot of this can apply to social media and website content and a bunch of other stuff. The big thing really is to create high quality content. I feel like there can be a lot of ideas coming from everywhere about what you should be writing about. And as Trish said, really the this kind of like inward looking self-centered content is really what puts people off. And so I'd encourage you to look around at what your audience is talking about and really focus on putting out content that they want to interact with rather than self-promotional content. And also just including lots of relevant links and calls to action that people can click on and continue to engage with your organization is huge. So these are just like the kind of basic metrics that I like to take a look at when I'm strapped for time. Um, obviously, it'll take more than five minutes to set this up on Google Analytics or whatever. But um, once you have it set up, really, it just rolls along. And um, yeah, you can get a lot of insights into how it's performing. So views are really what it says on the 10. Sometimes it's new versus returning users. But a lot of the time, that kind of doesn't matter too much. It's just good to get an idea of whether it's going up or down and which types of content are performing the best. Bounce rates are how many people enter and immediately leave. Don't be scared by this number. Generally, a number of like 75% or less, 70% or less. So I can look really high, but it's not. It's okay. <laughs> and conversions are the most important thing to focus on, in my opinion. Conversions in e-commerce often mean sales, but when we're talking about nonprofits, obviously that's a little bit different. So depending on your goals, it might be donations, it might be newsletter signups, it might be people who come to an online event, anything like that can really give you an idea that your blog or website content is encouraging people to engage with your organization further. So just to zoom in on the conversions a little bit, just here's some things to think about. You want to think about a barrier of entry. So for example, a newsletter sign up is a very low barrier of entry. Try not to ask for any more information than you have to, because that is more likely to put people off. So just asking for their email address or phone number is a great way of just putting them in touch with you. It means you can send them emails, you stay top of mind and they think about you going forward. But then also asking for donations, more from people who've interacted with your organization a little bit before is obviously really, like I said before, think about your goals. Are you on a fundraising drive? Are you trying to get signups to your um, events or galas or anything like that? Like, think about that when you're putting in your CTAs and thinking about the type of content. Um, and consider ease of tracking too. Donations can be tricky because sometimes people come and go, they sign up and then they come back later and make a donation. So something like an event attendance or a, a newsletter sign up can be a really helpful, like quick and easy way of seeing if like a blog you've published or something is encouraging people to interact with you more. Really, that's all I had to say. I think your work is more than cut out. You can dig around in these metrics as much as you want and find out more about how your content is functioning. And I think this, that's a really great way to cut out the noise and understand your audience, understand how your organization is interacting with them and how they want you to interact with them. I also just want to quickly say that I'm currently on the job hunt. I'm a content marketing and copywriting professional. And so if you are hiring or you need sort of help with a project or anything like that, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you just want to chat more about this stuff, I would love to hear from you. Hi, everyone. I'm Deepa, and I'm building AI tools to help nonprofits free up their time so they could focus more on their mission. I'm just going to show you how AI is going to 10x nonprofits. Um, so I've been a nonprofit professional, and I know how much time it takes to write grant proposals and how important grant proposals are because all the good work that you want to do is dependent on you being able to write a great proposal and getting the funding that is needed for you to do the work that you aim to do. I built a tool that can help you generate grant proposals or create grant proposals in minutes. And uh, I'm going to take the case of Eli and I'm, I'm just going to describe what I want to write the proposal for. And in less than five minutes, it's going to generate an entire proposal. Goal is to help nonprofits leverage technology by holding monthly events, inviting tech experts to talk to nonprofits. Simply describe it. You don't have to frame proper sentences. You can just put in just a description of what you want to write the proposal for. Even broken English is fine. And just hit create. And based on the description, the AI builds out this template. And 
as I said, I, I've worked in grants. I've written many grants. I've won grants from the likes of Rockefeller Foundation. So this is a standard grant template. It's, it talks about the problem statement, proposed solution, goals, and objectives. So, But based on the brief description that I provided, the AI has written the statement, it's written the solution briefly again, but this is not the entire proposal yet, but this is a chance for you as a nonprofit grant writer for you to make changes here. If our goal is to empower nonprofits with the skills and tools necessary to effectively use technology in their operations, we aim to achieve this by hosting monthly events. If you want to fine tune this, if you want to fine tune your plan of action based on your, your project, this is a chance for you to do it, but I'm not going to make any changes right now because I need to, I just have five minutes and Here's the eligibility assessment because you're applying to a donor and each donor has their eligibility criteria. You can copy and paste the eligibility assessment here and the AI will summarize how you meet that eligibility criteria. What are the areas you're not meeting? It'll highlight that so you can work on that. And so it does the work for you. I'm just going to say I'm ready to generate the proposal and I say generate proposal. Now this step takes about precisely three minutes. And as I said, I've written many grant proposals and I know how many days of work it takes. Literally, you've got to, just putting a proposal together sometimes takes seven to 10 days, just meeting with the team, just figuring out what will be the objectives, what will be the outcomes, what would be. And here, the AI just uses all of the knowledge. It's the large language models that are trained on uh, all of the knowledge that's on the internet, which is basically human knowledge to build out, to come up with those uh, objectives and timelines and deliverables. And you can tune it at that step, at the template step where I talked about it. If your goal is to reach uh, 500 nonprofits, maybe, uh, and the AI said, 300, maybe you can adjust it there. So you can fine tune it for your proposal, but just uses all its knowledge to build out a complete grant proposal for you in less than five minutes. So it is going to 10x the nonprofits. And this is a, a great uh, example of that right now. How can people uh, get access to this interesting new tool? Yeah. So this is invite only. I have many nonprofits trying it out right now at this point of time. So if anybody's interested, feel free to connect with me. I'm happy to extend this invitation to all the people who are here and happy to work with y'all closely because I'm trying to get as much feedback as possible. It's also a new way of thinking. Any apprehensions you have or if anything else you would like to be added on to this template that's not there right now, you could. But anyways, it should pop out a proposal anymore. It generated the entire proposal, gave it a title, a executive summary was auto-generated. Anything that's highlighted in green is for you to double check because this information the AI came up with, This they, it explained the problem statement, it coded N10, talking about the statistics uh, related to nonprofits and the awareness of our technology because as nonprofit professionals, we need to make a compelling case about why we are doing what we are doing. And so it describes uh, the problem really well. It's come up with a proposed solution is to host monthly events featuring tech experts providing nonprofits. It's detailed out the goals and objectives. Like this is something that I would have to sit and compute. Like when I, in the past, when I've written proposals in Singapore, I worked for a, a, a global nonprofit that was working on in the area of sanitation. And I had to sit and write proposals. Like if we provide Toilet. So what are the goals and objectives going to be? But the AI has done the thinking for me because all this, as I said, large language models are trained on all of human knowledge, which is, happens to be on the internet and, and it's trained on all of the internet. But again, this is something that you need to check that verify whether you're going to reach 100 nonprofit organizations. So it's up on Eli to decide like how many, what the outreach plan is going to be, ensure that at least 75% of event attendees report an improvement in the operational processes. So it's written an entire proposal for Eli if he wants to submit it to TechSoup uh, to get some funding for the Western Canadian chapter. <laughs> and this is a pl plan of action. It's even come up with timelines and deliverables, uh, which obviously you can take this proposal, go back to the person or the team that's going to implement this. It's come up with the evaluation plan. What are the metrics? Because every funder wants to know how you're going to evaluate the success of your program. So it's done that it's come up future funding is something that the uh, the funders ask like how, how do you plan to keep your program growing once the grant period is over the key personnel so it's uh, partnerships and stuff like that 
uh, organizational information, something you can just copy paste and put it and it'll, it'll nicely craft it for you in conclusion. And in case you want to go back and make any changes, like if you've discussed it with your, with your team and they feel like certain things need to be adjusted, you can go back to the same template, adjust the metrics here. If you want to fine tune the metrics or anything, hit another, I want, I'm ready to generate the proposal and then just generate another proposal. So. That's about it. So this is tuned on grants. It's highly engineered to write grants. It's something that I've worked in my life. I've written many grants. I've also given grants as part of my role at Salesforce Foundation. So I totally understand the space really well and I understand the pain points and how we can now leverage AI to really free up the time of the fundraiser so they could maybe look out for more grants apply for more grants. Every time you don't apply for grants, you miss out on that opportunity. So every grant not applied, you totally miss out on that. So it just frees up your time to, to do more. Yeah. And so this is just one piece of the puzzle that I'm solving at this point of time, but I'm building an entire range of tools to help nonprofits find who my fund is going to be. How do I report? Once you get the grant, I need to submit your report. So how do we, how can we use AI to just facilitate all of that? Awesome. That looks really powerful. And as Joel said, it solves the problem of, oh my gosh, I have an empty page. Where do I even start? Like now it becomes a, an iteration and editing process as you and your team work to get towards the grant that you actually need. Moment. My name is Nina Demian. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. What incredible speakers we've already had. Learned a ton. Um, I want to start off with just a bit of introduction, just so that you know why I'm here or how I got here, rather. I used to work for the nonprofit sector for about 15 years, and I worked for immigration organizations, I worked for community health clinics, and I've worked for education organizations, so I'm very familiar with the nonprofits. I made a career transition and decided to actually work with startups, so right now I'm actually a startup advisor with one of the largest incubators across Canada. We get to see or hundred startups every single year. So these are startups specifically in and around technology. And a lot of times the technology that I'm working with as a startup as advisor, they're social impact organizations. There are folks who are basically trying to provide opportunities for community to elevate itself and essentially and community organizations to leverage some really interesting technology rather than build it, perhaps buy it. And so I get to work with some incredible organization startups all the time. So that's my building right there in the back. It's this funky building in the middle of downtown Calgary, platform Calgary, home the front door to innovation. We've got this pitch stage that we have. So I get to see a lot of pitches and a lot of demo days. It's an absolutely incredible leech, electric environment to be a part of. And so having my background in the nonprofit sector, I started to realize one thing as someone who's, I love technology. I love leveraging technology. I started to realize that there was just a huge problem in the nonprofit sector. And this particular problem is how to leverage technology. And I'm so glad that there's such brilliant people on this call. But essentially for me, as a nonprofit employee, I was basically having to navigate their tech training labyrinth. If I wanted to upskill myself, I'd have to go through a lot of training and I didn't know which way to go, especially in the nonprofit sector, you wear so many different hats. It's like, where do I really need to focus my energy? I was a fund developer. So of course I focused a lot on development, but I really wanted to use innovative tools. Then there's also an option of traditional software and the traditional software usually comes at a cost because it's extremely expensive. And sometimes, especially with smaller nonprofits, it doesn't really meet what you need. And so there are modern startup solutions. And that's basically what I'm here to hopefully provide you with an opportunity to think outside the box. You've got the build option and you've got the buy option. A lot of times in the buy option, you don't really consider startups as your potential place in which you can actually purchase. But I want to make a case for this. It's modern and responsive. So essentially, it's really the most innovative stuff that's coming out. of The startups are absolutely incredible and it really meets the needs of community. Then it's cost effective and way cheaper than traditional software. And it's advanced. It's basically rather than you trying to figure out how AI works or trying to ensure that you've got uh, integration, they basically do it for you. And of course, they work with you very closely. It's one of the key things about startups is that they're really committed to you and your success. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And I don't know what my, oh, there it is, 150. Two examples, Need. It's called Need Technologies. This is a startup that I work with that I'm very proud to actually share amongst 
Meat technology was basically built specifically for food rescue. So as grocery stores or restaurants have food at the end of the day, what ends up happening with that food, unfortunately, goes directly into the dump. And so Mead has, is a, a technical tool. It's a logistics tool like Uber, but specifically for the food rescue space where they rescue the food and then provide it to the nonprofit sector. Absolutely brilliant. Another one is communal. I'm very lucky to be working with this particular startup that really alleviates the pressure on community associations that are usually extremely under-resourced in order to have, help them gain access to things like simple things like membership, simple things like booking a tennis court or a pickleball court. These things are so much more advanced once you actually leverage some of these technologies. And I'm not here as a startup advisor. I have no horse in this race. I don't have any shares. So those are two that I'm very proud of and I want to show you as examples. And of course, I really would love for you to spread the word about what they're trying to do. They're across Canada. They're doing really wonderful work. So they're really proven. I also wanted to have an honorable mention. I've got 34 seconds left. Tibby and Marmot Benefits. Marmot Benefits would be extremely beneficial to a lot of nonprofits. I would highly recommend you do a little bit of research on them. Kibi is a settlement agency app that is absolutely revolutionizing settlement agencies. So that's the reason why I'm here today is to share with you, want to make big impact, use newer technologies. I'm excited to bring in my colleague from TechSoup, Kevin Mahal, who's going to talk a little bit about, about process and workflow automation, i.e. putting the robots to work. Really quickly, a little bit about me. I joined TechSoup in 2019. I've moved up and around during that time. I began my technology certification path in 2020. I've since obtained several different certifications across multiple platforms as I've moved into customer success and then ultimately into my current role as a senior technical customer success manager. I am one part solutions architect, like the design and onboarding. I'm one part sales consultant, if you will. At this point, I actually hit over 2,000 consultations this past November. So I've met with a couple of orgs and hopefully have made some positive impact along the way. So what is process automation? Again, very like low level. I don't want to get, this could be a, a, an hour talk on itself. Process automation involves using technology to perform repetitive tasks or processes without human intervention. If I asked the audience here to raise their hands, if they currently do anything that they feel is even mildly redundant, I'm willing to bet that probably all of us would do that. The goal of process automation is to streamline and optimize workflows by automating routine activities, reducing errors, and enhancing efficiency. Now, process automation software itself refers to these specialized tools or platforms designed to automate these tasks often utilizing algorithms, scripts, or workflows designed to execute and manage the automated processes. Now, what problem does this solve? Redundancy. We in not the nonprofit space are lacking exponentially two things, res financial resources and time. While the money issue can go one way or another, the time issue I think is something that we all could potentially address using, using these types of tools. So these are some examples of it. So it's I don't, to get away from the generalization into the more specific, there are things like robotic process automation, business, uh, business process automation, AI, workflow automation, and then IT process uh, automation as well. Here's the tools of the trade. Zapier, for those that may not be familiar, Zapier Power, which is part of Microsoft 365, MuleSoft. Uh, there are way more than this. It, it goes well beyond that. I'd really like everyone to see what this looks like in action. Now, this is where the automation magic happens. The first step is our trigger. This is what kicks off a zap. Since we're managing leads, I'm going to pick my leads app, Facebook lead ads. Now, if you don't use Facebook lead ads, no problem. Zapier connects with thousands of apps, so we should have you covered. Once you select the app, pick the trigger event. This tells Zapier what to look out for. In this case, a new lead. Next, we'll connect our Facebook account. Once the account's connected, select the specific Facebook page we want the Zap to monitor and the form our leads are responding to. Now that this is all set, let's test the trigger. And there's a new lead. Let's keep going. We want our new leads to feel special. So we're gonna send them a personalized email, but I'm only gonna write it once. Just like when we added Facebook, we'll pick out our email app, Gmail. Now your app doesn't have to be Gmail since we have thousands of apps that connect to Zapier. 
This feel familiar? Setting up this step is a lot like our first step. Pick the app, pick the action, connect your account, and then you can get specific. With Gmail, we need to add in our send from email address, a subject line, and write the welcome message. Then we pick the Facebook information to populate into the email. I need their email address to make sure this gets to them. And here in the email body, I'll add their first name from Facebook lead ads. That way it'll feel like a real person wrote and sent this. Now we can test this step. Zapier says it worked, so let's go check Gmail. Look at that, there's the email. Just like that, you've automated your lead management. Just remember to turn the zap on. You're on the way to making copying and pasting and CSV uploads a thing of the past. But wait, you just saw that Facebook lead ads sends a lead's full name. It's kind of weird to address someone by their full name. So you want to split that name into the first and last name. Jump back into your zap and click on this little plus sign between steps. We're going to add a step here. Let's use one of Zapier's tools, the formatter. Formatter can do nearly anything. But in this case, we want it to split text. So once the app is selected, we'll find our text options, choose the action like before, and pick out the field from Facebook we want Formatter to change. We've selected the name field. Now I just need to tell Formatter where to split the text. In this case, the default is fine, a space. Done. Let's test this and jump back into our Gmail step real quick. We need to replace this output. We don't want to use the Facebook field name anymore. We want to use the first names from Formatter. And voila, Formatter is grabbing the name from Facebook, splitting it, and sending that to Gmail. Now, it's your turn. Create your own zap. Start small if you want or go big. Either way, once you're done, you'll get back to doing what matters. This is an example of some automations that I currently have running two of these. One of these is based around the concept and idea around this is that you are the, a lot of nonprofits use have a large tech spread. Sprout, they experience technology sprawl. They're using Google, they're using Microsoft, they're using Monday, they're using Calendly, they're using this, that, this, and that. Um, we go after them because they're free, but the next thing that we know is, is that we have a dozen applications that don't communicate with each other. The, the main goal and focus of a tool like, for example, Zapier, uh, is to be able to use APIs or webhooks to communicate with one another uh, on processes. Perfect example uh, is the flow that I'm gonna show here. Um, the trigger on this, cause it's always trigger and action. That's how the process automation works is that when a Calendly invite, which is the tool that I use is created that I want to bring over the information that is stored in the field lines into a monday.com board that I maintain. These applications do not normally talk to each other. And while they may have open APIs, if you don't know how to code, you, this is probably not going to be the easiest thing to do. So I would highly recommend considering a tool like this. So what this flow is ultimately going to do is when that information I'm collecting in my calendar, rather than me have to manually enter it into the dashboard for my technical consults, it brings over all of that information. I'm going to go back here. Okay. The main takeaways here is that process automation all in conjunction with AI offers a way for nonprofits to do more by do more with less, reducing the total number of hours of staff committed to tasks, allowing your organization to work across application platforms. If you have to have tech sprawl because of IT costs, this is a way to, to uh, inexpensively get those systems uh, to communicate with one another. Uh, if you have any questions around this, I answer technology questions across our entire global community. Um, I only speak English fluently. I do know a bit of Spanish and German, but that said, you can either reach out to me at the email address here or my colleague, Tony, at the address that's also posted here.